Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk, President Trump says his executive order on energy this week will fulfill a campaign promise to put miners back to work. Indiana will no longer be on a path uh, essentially for being disadvantaged from using its most abundant and reliable energy source, which is coal. But some say it's too little, too late. A convenience store found a loophole in the state's laws and is selling cold beer. The latest on what lawmakers are doing to halt sales at the store. Scott County, the area at the center of the state's HIV outbreak, is now in the spotlight for something else. This show is about becoming someone you want to be, not someone they see you as. How a high school is trying to challenge perceptions of their community through song. These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. President Donald Trump says he's keeping a campaign promise to bring back mining jobs. While people in the industry are hopeful the president's executive order overturning many Obama-era regulations will help, it might not make a huge difference. Sarah Whitmire reports. Before President Trump signed his executive order on energy this week, Vice President and former Governor Mike Pence repeated something voters heard a lot on the campaign trail. President Trump digs coal. When the president was stumping for votes, he accused the Obama administration of waging a war against coal and vowed to put an end to it. The action I'm taking today will eliminate federal overreach, restore economic freedom, and allow our companies and our workers to thrive, compete, and succeed on a level playing field for the first time in a long time, fellas. It's been a long time. The executive order lifts a moratorium on new coal leases on federal lands. It repeals a number of measures, including a requirement to consider the social cost of carbon emissions in all regulatory actions and crack down on methane emissions at oil and gas wells. The rule also eliminates an Obama-era rule restricting fracking on public lands and a separate rule that requires energy companies to provide data on methane emissions at oil and gas operations. In small towns that dot southwestern Indiana, it's welcome news. It will certainly put us on a path, um, essentially, to be able to move forward and where the coal industry will no longer be intentionally disadvantaged um, compared to other energy sources. Coal is plentiful in Indiana, and the state uses a lot of it. Hoosiers consume more coal than any other state, with the exception of Texas. Most of it's used to produce electricity. In 2014, coal produced 84 percent of Indiana's net generation. But in the last few years, those plants have started shutting down or converting to natural gas. Maybe as a stopgap, Trump digs coal. But in the longer run, you know, if you're looking 20 years down the road, um, we're not going to be digging a lot of coal. Indianapolis Power and Light estimated it spent $70 million to convert its Harding Street plant to natural gas. Yes, the move was in part to keep up with environmental regulations. But the primary reason? The falling price of natural gas. Slaper says economics, not regulations, is the real war on coal. With the Clean Power Plan, that's kind of a, a heavy-handed way to say you, you need to make the change like immediately. 
and then you could back it. Well, the market would do that anyhow. And then uh, you say, well, it's also very expensive to do it immediately. So why not, you know, so the arguments there are why not let the market do its thing? It's heading in that direction anyway, as opposed to a heavy-handed approach that might say, well, it's, you've got to make it happen sooner. Okay. Indiana produced about 13 percent less coal from 2014 to 2015 and shed 500 jobs during that one-year time period. Those coal jobs and all of the other jobs that they create by providing business for others actually helps to support, obviously, um, you know, tax revenue for roads, schools, programs, etc. While most of coal's competition is coming from natural gas, new technology is also bringing down the price of solar panels and wind power, making them more competitive. Indiana's Coal Council acknowledges it would be cost prohibitive to bring old coal plants back online. But in a statement responding to Trump's executive action, the council's president wrote, there is a, quote, better way forward, and today's action helps to re-energize a focus on innovation over costly and unnecessary regulations. Once there's a market-driven demand for something like clean coal, something, they'll figure out how to make it that way. Uh, so. I don't think coal is going to be out of the picture entirely, but I wouldn't uh, place bets on the long, you know, a lot of coal production across the country. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. Another complicating factor that will limit the effect of Trump's action is that the clean power plant is currently held up in the courts. Indiana is one of 28 states suing the EPA over the plan, and the Supreme Court last year temporarily blocked implementation of the rules. Many of the provisions in the plan weren't set to go into effect until 2022. The goal of the clean power plant was to reduce carbon emissions in an effort to slow climate change. Trump has called global warming a hoax invented by the Chinese. We've looked at one possible cause after another and striked one after another off. Meanwhile, the evidence that carbon dioxide is the cause has been mounting over time. So, yeah, I'm very comfortable saying that, uh, yeah, it's, it's happening and it's because of us. An Associated Press poll from September found 71 percent of Americans want the U.S. government to do something about global warming, including 6 percent who think the government should act even though they are not sure that climate change is happening. Now for headlines. We go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. An Indiana man who told police he was headed to a gay pride event in California and was found with a loaded assault rifle and chemicals mixed and ready to explode in his car has pleaded not guilty to weapons charges. James Wesley Howell was also charged with possessing a destructive device. Howell's attorney declined to comment. A Monroe County judge granted a request for more time for investigation in the case against Daniel Messel, charged with rape and battery in 2012. Messel is serving an 80-year sentence for the murder of IU student Hannah Wilson in 2015. Messel is appealing that conviction. The judge set the next pretrial conference for that 2012 case for May 30th. Carrier is one step closer to receiving a $7 million incentive to retain about 1,000 jobs in Indiana. The Indiana Economic Development Corporation approved the incentives this week. The State Commerce Secretary says the IEDC took that route because it was clear Carrier wasn't making an empty threat. You know, we look at every single deal individually, and we have to have to, a really hard evidence that, that the retention is needed, because if not, every company would threaten to leave. The deal is expected to pay for itself in about a year. This deal also won't spare at least 1,200 carrier workers from layoffs in Indianapolis and Huntington. The state legislature will have a public hearing later this year before carrier receives the money. The city of Bloomington is moving forward with its expansive annexation plan. Despite concern from residents, the county council and some city council members, Lindsay Wright reports. 
Property owners in Area 6 did succeed in gathering enough resident signatures to remove their area from the plan. But the city council at its meeting this week approved annexing all the other areas, a total of more than 900 acres. The scope and speed of this proposal could not have been anticipated by any of the other stakeholders. It's way beyond what any of us could have expected. We haven't had the time to absorb the implications. The city plans to offer further opportunities to hear input and answer questions before a formal public hearing on May 31st. The city council will vote on the proposal June 1st. If it's approved, the annexation would go into effect in 2020. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. Research from Purdue University could help in the growing fight against the opioid epidemic. Researchers have targeted an enzyme which could ultimately be an opioid replacement compound. Because it does relieve pain, it could replace opioids or it could be used in combination with opioids. So it would allow you to use a lower dose of the opioid and then decreasing your chance of developing dependence by combining compounds like ours with an opioid. Watts says the compound has been tested in opioid dependent animals and so far it appears to block the symptoms of dependence. Testing is still being done. Fundraising efforts are halfway complete to replace the 126 year old roof on one of Kokomo's historic tourist attractions. As Joe Wren reports, construction should begin this summer. The Kokomo historic Cyberling Mansion's roof still leaks, and architects say new slate must be installed before it causes major damage to the building's interior. The Cyberling Mansion is home to the Howard County Museum. Howard County Historical Society Executive Director Dave Broman says, although there are only halfway to their $1 million fundraising goal, he expects construction to start in July. This is a unique building with a history that um, that reflects on all of this part of the state, actually all of central Indiana, uh, because of its, of its role in the gas boom. Broman says construction includes fixing interior water damage and anticipates the mansion will remain open during construction. And Indiana University introduced new head Ben's basketball coach, Archie Miller, this week. Miller says he's honored to take on the role. Every player, every former coach, Every former manager that laid the groundwork for this place to be what it is today, you know, we owe them a lot. And our effort level and our give back has to be, you know, really unmatched. Miller has spent the last six seasons as the coach at Dayton, and he's accrued NCAA tournament appearances in each of the past four seasons. And Joe, Hoosier fans hoping he can do the same thing here. Good news this week, Colin Hartman returning. Absolutely. A lot more news, I'm sure, going to happen these next few weeks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We'll travel to a show choir rehearsal in Scott County where students' lives were affected by an HIV outbreak. And a conversation with South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Tim's. <laughs> there was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail. And the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life, and that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. South Bend's mayor made national headlines this year when he threw his name into the ring as a candidate for DNC chair. Reporter Barbara Brozier spoke to him this week, and Barbara, what's Mayor Pete Buttigieg focusing on now? Well, while he wasn't selected for the job of DNC chair, Mayor Pete, as South Bend residents call him, says he's still focused on helping to shape the party's future. But he wouldn't say where that role could lead him. 
You've been really busy yep. through your name in the ring for DNC chair. You didn't get that position, but you're on the advisory committee. How do you anticipate playing a role in the future of the Democratic Party? Well, my goal will be to make sure the Democratic Party is focusing on red and purple states uh, to make sure that we're paying attention to a new generation and to make sure that it's an organization that's ready to innovate. And I think uh, the new chairman has really signaled a desire to include everybody who is part of the process. I appreciate being included on the advisory committee and uh, we're actually gonna have our first meeting next week and a good opportunity to begin fleshing out some of these ideas. What are you hearing from folks in South Bend, Democrats in South Bend, about the direction they wanna see the party take? Well, there's, there's never been this much interest. There's never been this much concern. I think the real key for the party right now is to position the party in a broader tech of the different kinds of organizations that, that care about these issues. And, and you see a lot of grassroots, organic things coming together. A lot of people who may or may not consider themselves political in the traditional sense, but they care about the issues. The job of the party will be to make sure that they get involved in elections as well. There has been a, kind of this overwhelming focus on national politics, but you've talked a little bit about politics at the local level. Do you see politics at the level of South Bend, other small communities throughout Indiana becoming more important because of the national discourse? I, I do. I think every national problem is at its most real at the local level. And so I think the local level can also deliver a lot of the solutions that we need. Uh, you know, it's at the local level that you can get past a lot of the partisanship. You can get past a lot of the uh, a lot of the boxes and, and the, the baggage of, uh, of some of the old ways of solving problems and really be nimble and really be creative. I also just think we're nicer people at the local level because we actually know each other. And I think even in the biggest city, uh, you're better off when you're able to personally interact uh, with those different kinds of people. If we can get that mentality to penetrate to the national level of politics and government, I think we're all going to be a lot better off. A lot of people have called you the rising star of the Democratic Party. I know you're focused very much on South Bend. That's your home. You love it. But obviously, there's some interest from other folks about you helping to shape this party. Do you think someday down the road you may pursue higher office outside of South Bend? I've got a job to do right at home in South Bend. And, and one thing I've, uh, I've learned uh, during my short career in elected politics is you know, if you do a good job, at the job that's in front of you. Uh, future opportunities are going to take care of themselves. And if you can't do a good job at the job you've actually got, then nothing else matters. Buttigieg has been outspoken on Twitter about some of President Trump's policies. He says the South Bend community has been impacted by executive orders, including immigration. He referenced Roberto Barry Stein, the restaurant owner we've told you about before, who was arrested by ICE last month and scheduled for deportation. All right, thank you, Barbara. Someone to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's take a look at the top stories coming from Indiana State House. The Senate unveiled its $31.2 billion budget this week. It's slightly more than the Senate's proposal. One of the biggest differences is the Senate plan does not include a $1 per pack cigarette tax increase to pay for roads. But lawmakers say everything is still on the table as both chambers now work on a compromise budget proposal. And another area where both budget bills are at odds how to pay for a pre-K expansion. A debate erupted in two committees this week over Indiana's cold beer sales law after a convenience store Rickers' recent use of a legal loophole to sell cold beer. Normally when they pass a law, you're grandfathered in, but they even want to take ours away, and I complained about that. So we'll see what happens. I think it's unfair, and it actually, there's a constitutional prohibition, both state and federal, against taking away something once it's been approved. Indiana legislative leaders aren't certain they'll resolve a cold beer sales controversy this session. Efforts in legislative committees to undo Ricker's move hit a snag when stakeholders pointed out that the proposed language could affect movie theaters, golf courses, bowling alleys, and specialty food stores. The issue will likely be sent to a summer study committee. A bill that deals with parental notification of abortion is headed to the House. A girl under 18 can go to court to get consent for an abortion if her parents won't grant it. Proposed legislation would have required at least one parent be notified of that hearing, raising concerns about its confidentiality. An amendment says a parent would no longer be notified before the hearing. Instead, the judge would determine whether a parent is notified at all and only after the court grants consent. Indiana senators are looking to add more restrictions to a bill giving counties the right to set up syringe exchange programs without state approval. 
Four amendments from Republican lawmakers propose coordinating and sharing data with local law enforcement agencies, implementing a one-to-one -one clean to dirty needle exchange ratio, collecting demographic and drug use data from members and only distributing syringes. The committee unanimously approved a bill that rewrites regulations on the e-liquids industry. Indiana's existing vaping regulations essentially forced dozens of manufacturers to shut down or move. That prompted lawsuits and an FBI inquiry. Having those things means that it would be better for me to keep my company in Ohio and under the Seventh Circuit ruling, I would still be able to get a permit in Indiana and not have to abide by anything. And the reality is I have the Indiana torch on that flag tattooed on my arm. I'm a Hoosier through and through. It kills me that my business is in Ohio. After a number of changes this week, a committee unanimously approved the bill that aims to undo the controversy over the current law while still regulating the industry. A bill that would make state superintendent of public instruction an appointed position is back on the table. The bill was defeated in the Senate this session, but GOP Senate leader David Long says substantial amendments to the House's version could allow the full Senate to take it up again. Changes are expected to be considered Monday in a legislative panel. A bill to overhaul Indiana's standardized testing system passed out of a Senate committee. It establishes guidelines for a new state test that will re replace the ice step. It will likely lead to a new end of course assessment for grades 9 to 12 designated, designed by the ACT or SAT testing companies and another vendor designing a test for grades 3 to 8. Critics say the bill does nothing to address the big concerns of parents and teachers, which is over testing of kids. A bill that would change Indiana's net metering policy is headed to the House. The bill would slowly lower the amount of compensation, compensation Hoosiers receive for selling excess energy back to the grid. The committee did amend the bill, eliminating an exemption that allowed utility companies to reimburse at rates lower than the new rate. The deadline for both houses to finish their business and adjourn for the year is the end of April. The small Scott County town of Austin made national headlines for an HIV outbreak tied to injection drug use two years ago. Now Austin's making news for something else. The high school's Dimensions Show Choir is heading to a national competition. The theme of the show resonates with many of the students. love being on stage just because the people in the audience, I have no clue who half the people are, and when they see me up there, they just think, oh, she's a really good performer. They don't know all of the struggles I've had to face in my life and all of the bad things that people know my family for. I lost my mom in 2012 to drugs. She was 29 years old. Everyone has issues outside of the stage. Everyone in this choir has issues. We all have matters that are our demons. But when we're on the stage, nothing else matters but our music. A place to cast your soul. Oh, on and on, we carry on. Drugs has, has touched many of my kids. I mean, I have a student who's lost her parents to uh, drug abuse. Her grandma's been in prison. And this is the only safe place that she has. So music is really good for these kids. It's a place where they can kind of be their own person. We're kind of here to say, you know, that's the bad part, but look at us. We're doing something great, and why focus on the bad whenever you have something good like us? Kids who grow up in Austin aren't kids for very long, but we get a maturity about us, and in that maturity there is hope, because you can't go on fighting a war with no hope because this is a war and we have to be the people we want to be. We have to show the world that this is what the community is made of. We come out bad thugs, you know, bikers, and we're like, we're not gonna get stopped, we're unstoppable. We were born to rise and it's just, it's like Scott County as a whole. I want Scott County to be known for the good people and the good things that are happening. We might not be number one, but 
I think to our community and to people who know the show choir, we win. It warms my heart because my kids work really hard. And sometimes they just don't get recognized for all the great things that they do. I'm so proud. If I was a peacock, I'd be all feathered out. <laughs> The choir has to raise $15,000 in just three weeks to pay for the competition. They're hosting a chili supper and concert fundraiser Sunday, and they have a GoFundMe page where people can donate. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout South Central Indiana at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you.